I uh, hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, I'm sure you all got the reminder that this is uh, a recorded talk. So um, if you don't want your name um, shown publicly, or if you don't want your face shown, then um, you'll have to just uh, turn off turn off your video or just uh, got a made up name or something. All right, so first I want to acknowledge um, the um, original um, owners of this country. Uh, so I want to pay my res So here in the Sunshine Coast is the Gubby Gubby or Cubby Cubby people. Um, so I want to just pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So tonight's event is um, Christopher Henderson. Um, and it's about human impacts on biodiversity and uh, ecosystems. Uh, so first, we're just going to do a bit of an introduction. So to those of you who aren't familiar with Reef Tech Australia and what we do, um, we're a non-for-profit organization. And our goal is basically protecting the reefs and the ocean and um, by uh, community outreach, empowering people. Um, and that's a lot of the work that um, we as some uh, Reef Tech ambassadors um, are involved with. And we also do hands-on um, work uh, where we go out and actually uh, survey the coral reefs. And so that's a big part of what um, Reef Tech does. A few housekeeping rules. Um, if you can just keep uh, your videos off and uh, um, keep um, and stay muted, um, just so we can make sure that um, everything flows nicely and we don't have any connection issues, uh, that would be great. Um, if you're not on the mailing list, um, then you can email seqevents at reefcheckaustralia.org and you can be added to our monthly uh, e-news. Um, so what we might do, we might um, do questions. If you have any questions during the talk, feel free to just pop them in the chat, and then we'll um, at the end of the uh, at the end of the talk we'll um, go through the questions. Uh, so if anything springs to mind, feel free to just pop it in the chat. And we are going to do a group photo as well just before we kick off. So everyone just turn their cameras on for that. We'll do that at the end of the intro here. All right, we got a few upcoming events as well. Um, so we are involved with um, Raffle Sundays with your mates. So we're not, I think uh, your mates uh, has this on every Sunday. So we're there for a few dates. Um, come on, we'll be drinks, plenty to eat. Oh, let's get to the next one. <laughs> Uh, and there'll be uh, raffles as well, so all the proceeds go towards the check. And then there's Nurture Festival. Um, yeah, and that's May 7th uh, at Lake Kiwana. And then we're also involved with World Environment Day, so that's the entire month of June. Um, we got plenty of uh, um, things on for a World Environment Day. Then we're also at Prana Fest, which is May 27th to May 29th. And Ocean Film Festival World Tour, uh, they're in Brisbane on the 16th of June. Um, and then we have a few cleanups as well. So there's a Brisbane River flood cleanups um that's every day this week and there's also a beach cleanup on thursday i believe that's not up on here yes that's correct Ellen. Right. it's on yeah. thursday Phrygian beach ba62 okay got your Phrygian beach cleanup this thursday for anyone who's interested in that and then we also have fundraising uh so we have signed up uh, with uh, a company called Zero Co. So they have cleaning products and uh, um, personal sort of uh, well, well, wellness product uh, products. 
um, and they all come in um, containers that are um, recycled plastics. And um, yeah, so we've got a um, fundraiser on with that. And also, so if you want to get involved, you can always volunteer. Um, so you can volunteer as a Reef Ambassador, which is what I am, uh, where you get involved with uh, in different events and just various community outreach. Um, and also if you're a scuba diver, you can become a survey diver. So you need to be at least advanced uh, certified and have 25 log dives, and then you can become um, and get uh, involved in our survey diving. As always, check us out on all the social medias. And a big thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, we are a non for profit organization, so we rely on our sponsors to keep going. So, big thank you to Sunshine Coast. Uh, Sunshine Coast Council, Clean Water Group, uh, City of Gold Coast, Mask Events, uh, Port of Brisbane, and the Townsville Council. And of course, a big thank you to all of our volunteers, uh, especially all the Reef Ambassadors who are involved with organizing this every month. Um, big, big thank you to all of you. All right, now on for uh, tonight's speaker. So this month, we're going to hear from Dr. Christopher Henderson. He's a senior lecturer at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Um, Chris completed his PhD at Griffith University, where he assessed the effectiveness of the Morton Bay Marine Park for fish and how these effects were mediated by connectivity. Uh, now as a researcher and lecturer at USC, Chris's research focuses on a role of fish in coastal ecosystems with a particular interest in how the traits of different species can influence that role. Uh, so just before I hand it over to Chris, we're going to, we might do a group photo. So if everyone who wants their face shown can turn their cameras on. There we go. Beautiful. Give them a chance. Here we go. All right, big smile. Awesome, thank you. Um, then I might just hand it over to our speaker, Chris, if you want to share your screen. Thank you, Owen. Hello everyone, it's nice to um, see a few familiar faces in the crowd from USC. So I'm trying to try to get this to work properly. Awesome. All right, so today I'm gonna to basically take you through a bit of the research that um, I've been doing at USC, along with a few of my colleagues, um, in particular, Ben Gilby and Andrew Olds. Uh, for those of you who are from USC, you might remember them. Um, Basically, one of the key areas of our interest is looking at how humans actually impact on biodiversity and in particular, the functioning of ecosystems. So um, it's all well and good to go out there and count how many fish we see, but we, what we're really interested in now is actually looking at how um, removing particular types of species from an ecosystem can have a really significant impact on that ecosystem. So I'm gonna just jump straight in. And, so um, one of the most one of our historical approaches to assessing, I guess, change within an ecosystem is by measuring biodiversity. And biodiversity, in its simplest form, is is assessing the abundance, of, sorry, the number of different species that we have within an ecosystem. Um, and it's as simple as literally going out there and just counting the species that we see. But what we're finding with a whole with a lot of new research that we're doing, both from a genetic point of view, but also from a I guess from a function point of view, is that the role that species plays 
within an ecosystem is greater than just the sum of those numbers of species that are within there. So we know a number of different things drive biodiversity throughout ecosystems history. So we know species have evolved over time and ecosystems have evolved over time to have, I guess, the biodiversity that they have. Because, and in particular, they've evolved in a way that um, has allowed them to function in a really complement, complementary way. So what I mean by complementary in this situation is basically species perform roles within that ecosystem, whether that be predation or herbivory, and we'll jump into a few more of these shortly, but they perform different roles within an ecosystem that allow them to fit into a particular niche. And that niche within that ecosystem often is found to not be completely overlapping with other niches or other species within that ecosystem. And so it's that complementary factor of that ecosystem is really shapes how that ecosystem runs or functions. We know how heterogeneous a habitat is really influences biodiversity. That's why things such as coral reefs and headlands on um, in our coastal zones are really important. But also things such as competition and predation. So these are two interspecies related, I guess, factors that really drive the abundance and diversity of other species within an ecosystem. And we'll touch on a few examples about that shortly. We know climate and climate variability are two major factors that are driving species diversity and in particular species diversity um, and how species diversity is going to change into the future. And obviously climate change is a, is, um, is a big issue with that, with that factor. Productivity and how productive the world's ecosystems are. And finally, disturbance. And that's obviously going to be one of the key factors that I'll be talking about today, how disturbance really drives um, the changes in functioning within the ecosystem. So species play a number of different roles within, eco ecological, within ecosystems. So a number of different ecological functions that we see both in the terrestrial environment include predation, so predation by large carnivore species, which obviously plays a large top-down top role um, in driving those abundances of species below them. Uh, things such as herbivory. So we have an example of an elk here, and I'll go into more about that species in particular shortly, um, which performs herbivory and can have a major, major effect in changing the floral community below it. Carrying consumption by scavengers, we have seed dispersal and we have pollination, which is obviously a really key ecological function that occurs on the, on the land. When we look at the marine environment, however, we're a bit more limited within our, with our functions, because obviously we don't need to have that pollination effect, but um, things such as predation, herbivory, and carrying consumption are all performed by a number of different species and are all performed by a number of different species in different ways. So we have um, on this screen here, we have two fish herbivores and we have two fish carnivores. Okay, so how those different species perform the functions of predation and herbivory is really crucial to actually the functioning and the resilience of an ecosystem. So let's just take the um, herbivory example for a moment. We have a parrotfish up here on the left-hand side of the screen, which basically is really important in structuring the health of coral communities. They create space for the um, juvenile coral um, polyps to basically attach to the reef and grow. Whereas our rabbitfish species obviously play a really important role as a herbivore, I guess, eating down the abundance of macroalgae that may grow on a reef. So in those places where um, coral arts might be growing, macroalgae may come along, grow over the top of it, shade it and make it really hard for that species to grow. But when we have a healthy community of rabbit fish, we're able to actually, I guess, remove those large stands of macroalgae. So it's having those different species performing very similar functions, but performing, performing them in a different but complementary way, which is really important for structuring the resilience of an ecosystem. Um, there, are a there are a few famous examples of um, different species that uh, really drive um, the structure and functioning of ecosystems. And one of, our, one of the most famous examples, I guess probably the most famous example worldwide of um, different species having a role in functionally driving what else is happening in an ecosystem is what's happening in Yellowstone National Park. 
So in Yellowstone National Park, we obviously have a quite a diverse number of species that perform both predation, herbivory, but also a number of other functions. But the major, I guess, um, three, I guess, interconnected species that we've found a really dominant relationship between, which had a massive impact even more broadly, was the relationship between wolves, elk, and the plant aspen, which is this plant you can see in the background here. So those three species are obviously quite connected quite well. The elk feeds on the aspen, and the wolves obviously feed on the elk. And how those different um, species um, change in their abundance or move around Yellowstone National Park really influences the structure of that, of that park. In the past, what we found was that the wolves were hunted out of that region, which resulted in a boom in the abundance of the elk in the national park. They were no longer had threats from predation. And what that meant was that they were able to feed on a number of the different herb, um, plant species within that community. And that resulted in a dramatic shift in the aspen and the amount of aspen that was found within that um, national park, significantly changing how resilient that park was to a number of other threats that were also going on. Once wolves were reintroduced into the national park, they were able to once again feed on the aspen, on the elk, but it's also the indirect effects that they had on the elk, basically altering how they moved around the park, which then also altered how they were able to feed on the aspen. So these different species were um, intrinsically linked, I guess, to the resilience of that ecosystem. If you look at marine environments, one of the most famous examples, I guess, we have is um, sea otters, urchins, and kelp forests. Now, sea, ot sea otters are obviously a species that is renowned for feeding on urchins. And what we find in areas where um, otters have been removed because they've obviously been harvested for their pelts or um, whatever other urban impacts have occurred in those areas is that the urchin population booms. And because of that boom, it obviously has a dramatic impact on the kelp. The urchins feed down on the kelp, um, resulting in urchin barrens. So we can see how a number of different species are really driving that change in what's happening in an ecosystem. And it's because of this long-term evolution that these species and ecosystems have had to perform in a really complementary way, okay? And if people do have questions, I'm actually also pretty happy to answer them throughout. I'll um, try to answer them as I go. So one of the key things that we're finding from the, I guess the two examples that we've just spoken about now, but also a number of other research that we're finding from around the world is that not all species, I guess, are equal, okay? Some species obviously are really important in structuring the, the rest of that ecosystem, whether that be as um, termed as a keystone species, as things such as the wolves and the otters have been, whether that be species that are maybe considered umbrella species, so ones that I guess we could look at um, protecting an umbrella species because we know that when that species is present, they have a they can cause a often cause a shift in the remaining species that maybe um, maybe present in that ecosystem, or it's easier to protect a number of different species when we're only protecting when we're sort of protecting one really broad species. Um, and finally, indicator species. So these ones are ones that may be indicators of change. And this might be a species that we've found to be a really dominant grazer on a, on a reef, for example. So the rabbit fish is a great example of um, having a good number of rabbit fish on a reef. It's a good indicator of reef health because we know that they're gonna um, feed down that algae. So what is it that makes a species different? And it's basically the thing that we're getting into now in our research and the stuff that I'm basically going to take you through now um, very shortly is things called functional traits. So it's a morphological behavior, behavioral and physiological variation in species that causes them to be different. So a great example here are the two cat species, but also two species that perform pollination. So if we look at the two cat species we have here, we might we find that they both have different dentition, so they're going to feed in different ways. Whereas the two pollinators that we have here are obviously significantly different in size, and therefore are likely to be significantly different in how much of a, I guess, landscape effect they can have. 
Cool. So the question I guess is how do we go about incorporating this information that we have here on the traits of species into biodiversity and how we look at biodiversity. And that's where this thing called functional diversity, which I kind of gave away before, um, really comes in. So functional diversity is basically a new way of measuring diversity. Okay, instead of being as simple as we have three species, we therefore have species rich in sub three. Functional diversity really allows us to get a greater insight into the impact that a species has because it incorporates those traits. So I'm just going to take you through this dendrogram and this little figure that we have here for a moment because it will give you a bit of an understanding of what I'm sort of going to talk about for the rest of the um, for the rest of the talk. So if we have a look at this, um, I guess multi-dimensional plot we have up here on the left hand side, we have six different species. So by using these by using the traits of the different species, what we're able to find out is that species A and B are quite similar in their functional or physiological traits. Species F and E are quite similar, but species A and E are very different from each other. Now, this tells us that these species likely play a different role within the ecosystem. So if we were to have an ecosystem that contained species D, F and E, for example, and this is obviously just a really simple way of looking at this, um, it would have a lower functional diversity than a um, than a community that contained A, D, and E, because the species A, D, and E are all fundamentally different from each other. Okay, so by looking at things such as functional diversity, we're able to get an understanding of how of the roles of species within the ecosystem, and therefore a greater understanding of how that influences functioning. So what we're finding now in our research, both in coastal and marine environments, and but also on the land is that functional diversity is actually a much better predictor of functioning and what's actually happening in the, in, I guess, the ecological functions that species perform than our historical measures such as biodiversity, which is why we've decided to use it for a lot of our research and try to look at how it's impacted by people. So basically, I'm going to take you through three different case studies that myself and my colleagues have been working on over the last um, couple of years, basically, um, to give you both an insight into how humans influence, um, I guess, functioning, but in, in, um, in coastal ecosystems, but also how functional diversity as a metric or as a measure can be really influential in guiding us to understand how ecosystems may be functioning and how they might be changing over time. So this first case study is going to really look at how um, linking functioning to urbanization within estuaries. Our second case study is going to look at how we can understand the dr different drivers of functioning across the states. And in particular, here we looked at surf zones on the Sunshine Coast. And finally, we're going to get into a bit of a long-term study, um, looking at how long-term declines in coastal ecosystem functioning are, might be driven by humans. And for that, we'll look at um, some stuff I've been working on to do with the Queensland Shark Control Program. So case, first case study, how does landscape modification shape ecosystem functioning in coastal seascapes? So we know coastal seascapes are really driven by a number of different factors that influence the abundance and diversity of different species. And that, be, that may be the extent or their connectivity to natural habitats such as mangrove forests, it might be an indication of how much natural land there might be um, in the broader catchment of an estuary. So if we have a more natural um, land bordering an estuary, we're likely to have less um, runoff into that estuary, less sedimentation. And if we look at the opposite ends of the scales, we have things such as ports, and this is obviously the Port of Brisbane, which um, ha can have significant impacts, but also um, significantly can change the structure of an ecosystem such as an estuary. And we also have things such as farming. So farming, obviously, a lot of farming land within a broad catchment, and this is actually the Fitzroy River up near uh, Rockhampton. Um, there's quite a significant amount of farming and grazing land within that catchment. And because of that, there's often, this is often associated with a, a large degree of, I guess, runoff and sedimentation because of changes that have happened over a long period of time to the riparian vegetation that are associated with farming or with grazing in particular. 
So what we did here was we sampled 39 estuaries from Yapoon, in the, or just north of Yapoon in the north, all the way down to the southern end of the Gold Coast. And we used underwater cameras and we used both baited and unbaited cameras across this range to basically get an understanding of the fish that are present within each of these different ecosystems, but also the factors that are driving those different fish. And you can obviously see it throughout this range, we have quite a significant variation within the amount of grazing land or agricultural land, which we have in brown here, the area of natural land and the area of urban land. So our areas found in the um, southern parts of Queensland are obviously a lot more urban. So we have the estuaries down here that I'm sure most of you have seen on the Gold Coast or the Sunshine Coast or around Brisbane that are fundamentally, have been fundamentally reshaped. So places such as the Narang River and the Brisbane River are obviously fundamentally different to what they were 100, 200 years ago. When we get further north, we start to lose a lot of that. We have really natural estuaries, estuaries that are still bordered by a large amount of riparian vegetation, but we have estuaries that also have a large amount of farming land within their broader catchment. So this, um, this little spot up here is actually the mouth of the Fitzroy River, and it's actually the most the biggest estuary I've ever worked in is a pain in the ass, but that's a whole nother story. So basically what we want to find out was what are the things that drive functional diversity change over time? And basically what we're looking for here is we're looking for a greater level of functional diversity, okay? A greater level of functional diversity suggests that there are more species across a greater number of niches found within that ecosystem, okay? So if we find that something is having a positive effect on um, functional diversity, it would suggest that there are a greater number of both species, but also functional roles present within those um, different areas. So when we went and looked at our, um, how functional diversity changed throughout these different estuaries and how that related to different factors such as urban and natural land and um, agricultural land, what we found was some pretty odd results actually. And the, and the first one here that I'm gonna show you is that we actually found that functional diversity was highest in areas that had a greater amount of urban land. So we can see here, this little hump is sort of at its highest when we're starting to get to quite a large amount of urban land nearby to that estuary. So that's 1,000 square kilometers of urban land within the catchment. When we looked at natural land, what we actually found was that functional diversity decreased over time with, natural, over, um, with a greater extent of natural land. So we're starting to see some bit of an odd relationship here. We found that with increased grazing land in the catchment, what we found was that there was actually greater functional diversity. And when we looked at the area of mangroves, we actually found that mangroves were at their, that functional diversity was at its lowest. Um, then we had more mangroves in the catchment. And so I would actually say before we did this study that each of these results was quite the opposite to what we expected. Now, I think this comes down to a number of different things that particularly urban land in particular really offer or provide for fish. So I guess many of you have probably had an opportunity to work around the mouth of estuaries at this point in time or on reefs that are close to estuaries. And one of the key things that we find is that having urban structures within an estuary actually provides a really important focal area. Um, for fish and it provides a really important area for people, to, for people to fish on those fish, but also to try to catch those fish. But it also provides a number of different feeding niches for different fish. But when we got further into our results, we found some different, some, I guess some positives and some negatives. So we found that some species were really benefiting from, I guess, high amounts of urban land and attachment. And that was species such as our toadfishes, which were doing much better in their abundances in large amounts of urban land and also high grazing land. Similarly, we found out um, fusiform zebentivores. So these are things such as whiting, which are smaller zebentivores that sort of feed on the ground and feed on small um, invertebrates that live in the sand. But once again, more abundant in our um, urban, highly urban, urbanized areas. But what we actually also found was that we were losing our really important target species. So our larger Pispigua species, such as our mackerels, were disappearing from these um, highly urban areas. And we were also losing other important um, Piscivores, such as our barramundi, 
or even our flathead, we're all lower in our urban environments. So we're moving from an area where we're finding a lot of these naturally um, really important um, higher order predatory uh, fish species that might shape the remaining um, fish within, an eco within the ecosystem. And we're replacing these with our sort of dominant, a large number of different types of zoobentivores. So species that like to feed around urban structures, but also feed within the sediment. Some of these different species, such as whiting, are also um, a prized catch for people and a target for fishermen, but not to the level of the species that we're losing. So we're seeing overall quite, um, I guess, a functional downgrading of our coastal ecosystems, even though we had a slight increase in functional diversity. All right. So our second study was basically looking at how does connectivity shape ecosystem functioning in coastal surf zones? And so we wanted to look at basically a number of the different surf zones along the Sunshine Coast. So we surveyed all the way from Alexandra Bay, Alexandria Bay in the north, north just up at Noosa, all the way down to Kings Beach in the south. And the, and the great thing, as many of you who are involved with Reef Check um, are probably well aware, is that each of these different beaches are obviously quite diverse in the different habitats that they have nearby. So we obviously have um, important headlands, such as places like Point Cartwright, near a lot of our different beaches. We have places such as Majimba Island. We have some really fascinating um, and interesting reef sites just off the coast here, which all provide, I guess, fish habitat and structured fish habitat for um, the fish that live within surf zones. But we also found that um, we also wanted to look at how does things such as estuaries, so are not, not a super structured by a hard structure thing like reefs, but more mangroves and seagrass. How does this sort of habitat also influence fish? So we wanted to basically look at how does this connectivity with these different habitats shape ecosystem functioning? Because what we can learn from things such as connectivity is if we can manage for connectivity, we can, I guess, get over the negative effects of urbanization in some areas. So we, as I said before, we sampled 20 beaches across the coastline and basically we use gloves, which are a baited remote underwater video station. So it's a GoPro attached to a weight with a bit of um, bait at the front of it. And we, use, we sampled these 20 different sites. Now in order to get to these different ones, we actually kayaked out through the surf. Um, which was obviously a very fun activity, but also quite a dangerous activity, but we can talk about that later. So when we wanted to look at functional, and I'll, go, I'll work through these graphs in a moment, so don't get too far ahead of yourselves, but basically when we looked at what things were driving um, the abundance and diversity and the functional diversity of things within the surf zones, we found that it was all about reefs. So reefs were the primary driver of what was happening in the surf zones. So I'm just going to work our way through these different components here on the left-hand side first. But what we found was that functional richness, so I guess how broad and how large of a niche, overall niche do we have within an ecosystem, within a sample, what we found was that functional richness itself was always highest when we were close or had reef within the surf zone. So think about places such as Moffat Beach and Dickey Beach. These are places that have quite a large amount of reef within them. Um, think about places up towards Point Cartwright, around even Mooloola These beaches were all really um, dominated by reef, rocky reef nearby. And that therefore resulted in them having a much larger functional diversity and overall diversity. When we looked at things such as functional dispersion, so this is a metric that really gets into how variable, I guess, a community is. Um, and variability within community is, that, is also linked to resilience within that community. We found that once again, functional richness was really um, high in these areas that were closer to reefs. And finally, when we looked at functional evenness, which is another metric which basically looks at how evenly spread the abundance is across those different niches within that community. We found that this was generally higher at those spots that were closer to reef, but there was also some high levels of evenness further away. 
And this sort of followed our trend of species diversity as well. So now this graph on the right, what we basically wanted to look at here was, okay, we can take these couple of different metrics over here and try to visualize them a, little, a bit better so we can get a bit of an understanding of what's actually going on. So when we look at our beaches that contain rocky reefs, and that's this figure here, what we see is that we have, first of all, we have a, a larger number of species. So species are obviously the dots that we have um, in this figure, and the little lines represent how they are far away um, from, I guess, the mean of species that are quite similar. So in the blue, we have our piscivores. In the pink, we have our zooplanktivores. In the purple, we have zoobenthivores, so things that feed on um, invertebrates and small fishes. And um, we have some corallivores and herbivores and detritivores in there as well. So you can see that when we look at beaches that contain quite a large amount of rocky reef, they were really high in diversity, but are also high in how variable they were around those, how variable the species were around that those different functional groups. As we started to move further away from reefs, so we looked at species and communities that were close to reefs, so this was in the first few hundred metres, we could see an immediate drop off. So when we look at piscivores, for example, this one here, we can see a significant change in the number of piscivores that are occurring here, but also how variable they are compared to what's going on over here. We can see that we're losing a whole arm of these um, of, I guess of these different, of this type of species. So we're losing that, I guess, inbuilt resilience to future disturbance. If we were to lose more, um, I guess, more piscivorous species because of whether it be fishing or whatever, we might find that we might lose the function of piscivory within that ecosystem. As we move further away from these beach, from these rocky reefs, we're finding once again, less species overall. And then once we get to our further sites that we're really far away from reefs, we're finding that we're having, we have barely any diversity, but also barely any variation within that diversity. So we're not far off having basically, I guess, a, a non-structure, a non-functioning ecosystem. So we can see from this how important it is to maintain connectivity. So increased co connectivity resulted in improved functioning of, of this coastal ecosystem. So it resulted in a greater number of higher order piscivorous species, such as mackerels, even tiger sharks present within the surf and trevallies, but it also resulted in a higher abundance of herbivorous species. Now, obviously things such as the black rabbit fish may, may not be everyone's favorite fish, um, but they play a really, as I said, it's talking about before with rabbit fish, they play a really important role in structuring other, um, I guess, fun, other things on reefs, for example, such as macroalgae abundance. So understanding the impacts that connectivity has on things such as functional diversity really highlights how function may change across a land or seascape. So we know from a number, a large amount of work that we've done in the past that biodiversity and abundance changes, obviously, with um, variations in connectivity. But now we know that functional diversity also changes, and that is obviously much more linked to the functioning of ecosystems. So we know from this study that connectivity with reefs was really important, and that we can use the benefits of highly connected ecosystems to actually manage systems that may be experiencing negative consequences from human impacts. So if we take the, pre the, last, um, the previous case study, and we look at something such as restoration, so can we, could we have improved the outcomes of the previous study by, I guess, restoring structured habitats or habitats that we know that are really important in those ecosystems to those estuaries, which would therefore, I guess, diminish the negative effects associated with the urbanization of, or urban impacts in some of those catchments and estuaries. All right. Um, and finally, the last, talk, last case study I'm going to talk about is um, effectively long-term functional downgrading of coastal ecosystems. And for this one, I'm going to use the Queensland Shark Control Program as an example of a, um, I guess, a long-term impact, because first of all, it's a great data source in the sense of they've been collecting data for a, lot, a not large number of years, but they also, um, um, it, and it gives us an insight into how a number of these really high water predators might be changing over time. And there's been a number of different studies that have looked at how, I guess, the abundance of these species changes over time. 
but we haven't really been able to look at how that might be then linked to the resilience of coastal ecosystems. And I want to make it, um, I want to, before I, I guess, jump too far ahead of myself, I want to look at basically um, and say that the Queensland Shark Control Program is, I guess, an example of one of these impacts that have had long term um, impacts on coastal ecosystems. So the Queensland Shark Control Program has been running from 1963 to, to, to current. Um, they use a series of, net, um, of nets and drum lines, and you can see images in the, um, on the right-hand side that detail what those basically are. But basically, one of the key points is that they have changed in how they, um, their, their efforts throughout the years. And particularly, they've moved away from nets in particular. So a lot of our beaches along um, the coast used to be dominated by shark nets, but now uh, mostly have drum lines. And that's associated with changes in bycatch predominantly. So the Queensland Shark Control Program and Department of Fisheries have really worked really hard to try to remove and de decrease the impact of bycatch associated with the Queensland Shark Control Program over time. So the program uses has um, sampled across 86 different beaches with, within 10 different regions. And this basically runs from Cairns to the Gold Coast, so predominantly our swimming beaches. So the historical aim of the program has been to, remo to remove and um, to remove large sharks from swimming beaches in order to try to reduce the chance of um, sharks from the interactions. So there's a lot going on here, and I want to take you through it sort of step by step. But basically what we've found overall over time, so over the last 60 odd years, is that the impacts of the Queensland Shark Control Program has had a fundamental change in the functional diversity and the different aspects of functional diversity over time. So functional dispersion, one of the variables I was talking to you about before, and, um, and each, obviously each of these graphs follow is a very similar trend, but they have a slightly different meaning. We've found that functional diversity over time, functional dispersion over time has decreased significantly. And what this generally is associated with is a reduced variation in the species that are found, but also a reduced variation in the traits of those species. So what we're finding now is that instead of what we were catching in 1963 was a whole variety of different species that performed a whole variety of different functions, what we're catching now is a really small subset of that. And we're continuing to just catch those species. So obviously this is dominated by um, medium to large whale oil species in particular. Then we look at things such as a decline in functional evenness. What we lose, what we're ha what's happening here, and in particular in this situation, is we're finding the emptying of those functional niches. So we're not only are we losing the important traits of these different species. We're also losing different niches, and that's sort of highlighted by this figure on the right here, where we can sort of see a change in uh, from green to red over time, where basically our niches, the niches of the different groups are shrinking, but also completely emptying. So this will have all these uh, long term ramifications for how coastal ecosystems function. When we look at functional richness, another obviously declining, obviously the different. Uh, variables have all declined in a very similar way with an initial increase. And I think this is probably likely to be due to changes in the shark net, um, in the way that the shark net program was um, delivered, I guess, because historically when they first started, the nets were set in different ways. So they caught different types of species and there's a whole number of different questions I can answer about that one. But what we found was generally an initial increase in functional diversity over time for each of the different metrics, followed by a substantial decrease. And when we looked at changes in this measure of functional richness, what we find is that overall we're losing functional space. So we're moving from a really diverse ecosystem, a diverse community, to a much more simplified one. So that if you think about before how I was talking about the six different letter species um, at the very start of the talk, where we only have a community that might have a few of those different letters that are really close. So we, we're moving to coastal ecosystems that are fundamentally driven by species that are relatively similar. And that can obviously have detrimental impact because we're losing the, the functions that are provided by those species overall in the, in the periphery of the community. 
And overall, what we found though is that there was a significant decrease in functional diversity over time. And this obviously leads to a decrease in ecosystem and the ecological functioning, which we find is overall going to decrease under this scenario. Now, I'm gonna direct your attention to this first, this large figure on the left here. But what we found overall when we looked at that entire community, and if you, if you look at this figure, like you looked at one of the, at the letter figure at the start of the um, talk, dots that are pretty close to one another are very similar in, in their structure, and dots that are further away from one another are obviously very different. Now in this figure here, I've colored the dots from a dark blue to a light blue. And basically the, uh, the darker, the, the communities that were caught in the shark net program in the really early components of the program, and those that are sort of in the lighter areas on towards the bottom right hand side are those that are what we're catching now. So what we're seeing is a complete change over time in the community structure of the species that are being caught in the shark control program. And this is obviously this follows trends that have been published before um, by different in different papers, but we've seen a significant decline in apex predators such as the great white. In the early days of the program, we saw a significant decline in the grey nest shark um, catch. And obviously, up until and even more recently, into the 2000s, we're seeing a significant decline in the catch of hammerhead sharks. So, what does this mean for functioning? Basically, we took these are the different traits that we've used to, to incorporate into our function and diversity measures. So, we looked at how different species had different types of teeth. We looked at the different some of the different morphological features of different species. We looked at what their trophic level was, so where they sit in the, um, I guess, in the food web. We looked at what they fed on, and we looked at how large they are. And what we found is that the things that are in blue, the traits that are in blue are those that are decreasing over time. And they're being replaced by increases in um, those traits in red. So what we're finding is that we're catching um, I guess, smaller species. And that's high, further highlighted by this change over time in the average shark length of, of individuals caught in the program, but also losing things such as apex predators. So that goes back to things such as the great white or the tiger shark or the bull shark or a few other different species that we've seen over time that are decreasing. And they're being replaced by things such as benthivores. So benthivores are species that I guess feed once again in the sediment, feed on invertebrates or feed on small fish. So take home messages. Um, basically functional diversity is, and functioning is a really important way of assessing how humans are influencing ecosystems. Um, it really gives us an insight into how um, we are really going to, we are really changing the structure and functioning of those ecosystems, but also the resilience of them. Um, and just from a couple of the different studies here, we've seen that humans are having a significant impact on functional and biodiversity um, alike, and that's gonna obviously have long-term ramifications. However, with things such as the second case study, we can actually learn about ways of improving both functional diversity, but also the functioning of ecosystems by incorporating uh, variables such as increased connectivity and restoration into our, um, I guess, management plans of coastal ecosystems, we can have a significant improvement on how those ecosystems function in the future. And I think that's basically all I've got for you all today. So are there any questions? I'm gonna stop my share. Thanks, Chris. I really enjoyed that. Haven't got any questions, but that was awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. I've got one for you. Yep. What you're saying about the size of the sharks is declining. Mm -hmm. Is that because we're, do you think we're catching more of them so they're not getting a chance to grow to those sizes we were seeing or are the bigger ones just staying further offshore perhaps? Um, it's probably a bit of a combination of all of those. So there was a paper that came out in the 90s that looked at basically how um, 
the Queensland New South Wales and South African shark control programs and what influence they're having on the um on the rest of the on the sharks that they're catching. Um, and one of the key, I guess, takeaway points even that early on. So the Queensland ones, I think that I think the Queensland one is the second oldest program. I think New South Wales came first, then Queensland, then KwaZulu and Natal. Um, basically what they're founding, finding is that they found even then that there was a significant change over time in the average length of sharks that they were catching. So I do think that they are they are being successful in their their aim, which is to remove large sharks from the from the area. Um, I wouldn't say that they're probably not allowing them to get to a certain length. Like they're not catch like they're not catching what they used to catch. They're not pulling out dozens and dozens of sharks anymore. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm still unsure. <laughs> um, but they are, they are, I guess, really targeted in what they're catching. I think the type of methods that they use is really suited to larger sharks. So things such as the drum lines in particular. Okay, thank you. Just a question regarding removing the sharks. Are they, uh, do they, to, uh, euthanize them or do they take them out further out it, to sea or what uh, do you know what they do with them um a lot of the times they're already dead um if they've drowned in the net or they've drowned on the hook um if they're not they swim them out or they don't swim them out but they basically tie them up to the side of the boat and take them offshore and release um in new south wales in particular they have a full-on um catch release program and they're actually and it would be great to see that implemented in Queensland one day um, where they actually monitor their drum lines um, they use smart drum lines which allows them to find out if a shark has been hooked on the drum line they can then go out tag it and release it and they can then track it rather than what we have in Queensland which is basically a, um, people that go out and check them every couple of days um and if they find something they'll find something yeah More it's a shame we haven't got those smart ones here yet would have been good if they yeah started i mean like, so like obviously it's sensationalized a lot in the media but when i'm talking about pulling out sharks they're probably pulling out maybe one large shark on a drum one a year so we, we see places like i think i heard a thing the other week it was like or, a couple, or last year or something like that that a tiger shark was caught at Majimba. That was probably the only tiger shark that's been caught at Majimba for the last few years. So we're not catching like hundreds of sharks when you're pulling them out. It's quite that's surprising. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah. So. Mm. And uh, do you know in KwaZulu Natal they use the uh, magnetic um, fishing well uh, 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 mm -hmm. thing? Um, yeah. Why they haven't employed that in Australia? I think one of the key reasons is because of um i guess our coastline is a lot more exposed than what it is in durban um i know durban's just, obviously it's still quite an exposed coastline um and i know that they also pull out their nets for half a year because of the humpbacks which is another thing that would be great if we did but whatever um i think they've been really actively trialing those different uh, methods and I think that's because some of the areas in particular around Durban, and you might know better than me, I'm not sure, um, that they are um, more suited to places like Durban. So we might find that they might be more suited to places like Cairns and Townsville rather than places like the Gold Coast or the Sunshine Coast. All right, thanks. Okay, do we have any more questions? <laughs> so how did you go with the brubs getting out through the first time? Oh, it was interesting. <laughs> um, some days were much easier than others. We basically like had to pick our days, but then obviously um, sometimes it just didn't work well. I had a day that we were basically out of Twin Waters. Um, and you guys have probably been around that area before, um, where 
it was okay. And then all of a sudden we just had a big set come through that just smoked me on the car <laughs> out the back and it um, ended very poorly. I had to swim a lot. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah, very fun. Type two fun. Yes. Did you have, um, have you got any tales where your favorite or worst day of your um, PhD or um, your studies um, out of something that stands out or anything? Worst day. Any day that I tried to sample the Fitzroy River was pretty bad. Um, just because it's such a big estuary, it's like five kilometers wide at the mouth. For an estuary. So I think about that in the context of like the Sunshine Coast. That's like from Marichidor to Malula River Mouse was a was a whole entire estuary. Um so that wasn't very fun. Um no, no, not what I can think of off the top of my head. I'm just trying to think of Nicola's question. Um, are there any trials for actually increasing the presence of coral reefs in the beaches using artificial structures? I think that is a thing that is being worked on. Um, I know there are a number of companies out there that are really getting into the restoration space and in particular reefs. Um, as I was sort of alluding to before with regards to the shark control program, there are, I guess, a number of issues associated with um, high surf activity and that sort of thing along our beaches. Um, so they would have to obviously be really strong structures um, to allow them to survive the surf. Um, I obviously think about times like what we've had recently with large amounts of floods, but from the surf point of view, when we have a cyclone come by. Um, but there are things happening. There are definitely things happening in the oyster reef space in our estuaries, um, but not so much that I'm aware of on beaches, but Jody and some of the other guys might be more aware. I have yeah, I think, sorry, I just, yeah, I mm -hmm. want to say thanks for that because it's really interesting what they're they're doing with um, like kelp and sea grasses and looking into making um, structures that can kind of withstand the um, the ocean surges to increase yeah. the diversity um, and for like aquaculture as well. But yeah, I just thought that, that would be an interesting thing. To yeah, do no, I think it's a, it's definitely an interesting space. And like I think about places like like. Um, the Bay of Musa, like those sort of areas are much more protected. And I know a lot of the kelp, a lot of kelp areas are in, a lot of kelp ecosystems are in low impacted surf areas and not always so generally like directly on the surf beach. So they, they themselves obviously lend to be more likely to be, um, I guess, simple, like more simple to restore, restore in those areas. Um, because I don't have to deal with, I guess, those factors. Things such as reefs, so are uh, obviously a bit of a different story there for a different reason, um, often. So, yeah, I guess it, I, I think that's definitely a next step, though. There is a, a something they're putting down at the Gold Coast. These huge structures um, that they're hoping will attract. I don't know, fish or divers or something. Yeah, I've heard about that. The, um, yeah, like these artificial reef, artificial yeah. dive site projects. Like, think about the HMAS Brisbane, for example. The HMAS Brisbane is a great example of an artificial reef. Yeah, sure is. Hmm. Agreed. Do some more ships, absolutely. Um, do we have any more questions for Chris? Well, thank you so much, Chris. That was a very great talk. Um, yeah, really informative. I agree. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Cool. So um, if there's no more questions, we might um, cut it there, I think. <laughs>